billed as the largest digital archaeological reconstruction ever undertaken, Rome Reborn is cutting-edge technology from new tech demos. Images of approximately 7,000 buildings recapture Rome at the peak of its glory in 320 AD, during the reign of Constantine the Great. Using a handheld device, the virtual tourist can get a 360 degree view of how the city used to look. The technology can be applied to any site. The model that we're using has been constructed very meticulously by a team of researchers in order to faithfully represent the way Rome would have looked in 320 AD. This type of display has advanced rapidly due to the acceleration of computer graphics technology. The designers believe the system will be used as a new type of historical exhibit in museums. The next stage in the development of the virtual technology will see tours becoming available over the internet. This type of application is already being used in flight simulators and it has great potential in a range of different areas. But although it's a powerful educational tool, nothing can compare to actually being in the city beside the Colosseum. And Rome is not the only place to have been digitally recreated. The Forbidden City to the north of Tiananmen Square is the world's largest palace complex, covering 74 hectares. Now a 3D model of the Forbidden City is available, opening the city to those who might never see it in real life. It enables visitors to experience all aspects of the imperial city, as it was during the reign of the Ming and Qing emperors. When we first began this project, many colleagues thought it would affect the numbers who come to visit the Forbidden City. We said, it won't happen. This will bring even more visitors. It is the first time that IBM has employed its service-orientated architecture and on-demand computing resources to create an online 3D virtual world. The Forbidden City is divided into two parts. The emperors of the past ruled the nation from the southern section or the outer court. The northern section or the inner court is where the emperor lived with his family. The last emperor of China was driven out in 1924. Museum visitors can watch dramatized scenes such as court officials meeting in conference with the emperor. They can interact with each other or with a wide range of volunteers, staff and automated characters through pre-recorded or live guided tours on topics such as dragons, the imperial gardens or feng shui. Listed by UNESCO as a World Cultural Heritage Site in 1987, the Palace Museum is now one of the most popular tourist attractions in the world. Because this is the most visited museum in the world, the software developers were faced with a huge challenge. They had to create a forbidden city that can handle a lot of traffic. Using motion capture techniques, they developed character avatars that dressed in a historically accurate manner. Currently, most virtual worlds have a limit of around 50 or 60 people. The IBM developers had to make a system that would cope with thousands. Several thousand visitor avatars are able to coexist in the virtual museum. Having been the Imperial Palace for five centuries, the Palace Museum houses numerous rare treasures and curiosities. Building work on the palace complex began in 1407 and was completed in 1420. This virtual reality has one big benefit. It not only gets around geography, it also gets around time. I have not even seen what a Qing or Ming dynasty emperor looks like. But using this technology, they can turn a lot of the written record into something interactive to bring you to this world and let you interact. 
In the Forbidden City, you can take six different tours, but educators can actually lead a tour around various areas of the palace complex. So experts in different aspects of the Imperial Palace can use the virtual reality site in a similar fashion to the way an actual tour guide can lead a specialty tour around the physical museum. Iceland has abundant natural reservoirs of water and ice. And because it sits on a geological hotspot, thermal springs with steamy discharges are common. The country uses geothermal energy to generate cheap, clean power. Meltwater from glaciers is also used to generate electricity. The only fossil fuel the country uses is for vehicles and transport. We have been steadily developing our geothermal harnessing while other nations have not been. Uh, therefore, cutting edge technology, bringing in new solutions has happened here in Iceland for the past decades. Iceland's abundance of water and its volcanic structure also provide the country with natural hot water. In many places, this is piped and used for heating. Again, this has a very positive effect on Iceland's carbon footprint. But experts are warning that the wasteful use of natural hot water could deplete the resource. Energy is so cheap that geothermal water is used to keep pavements and car parks snow free during the winter. Having an endless supply of geothermal water means 99% of homes in Iceland are run on renewables. Hot water from the springs is cooled and pumped into the taps of nearby homes. Stefan Arnoldsen from the University of Iceland is an expert in geothermal energy. He warns that the resource should not be taken for granted. Almost 90% of the people of Iceland, they use geothermal hot water for heating their home. So cheap is electricity in Iceland that they are looking to convert it to hydrogen to cut the country's reliance on fossil fuel to zero. Valdis Asta Adelsteindorter is from Reykjavik. Married with two children, she works for the country's Civil Aviation Authority. Valdis says that during the winter, the family keep their heating system at 25 degrees Celsius. She thinks that Icelanders take water for granted, but she also considers her country's water to be the best in the world. Geothermal energy in Iceland first happened in the early years of the 20th century, when an enterprising farmer diverted a stream from a hot spring to heat his house. Four decades later, the hot water was piped to houses and swimming pools across the island. Blue Lagoon is Iceland's largest geothermal public bath. Opened in 1989, it has become an important tourist spot. Iceland's location on one of the Earth's major fault lines, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, means the country is dotted with volcanoes and hot springs. Reykjavik Energy, Iceland's biggest energy company, runs the Hellas Heidi power plant, which is still only partially completed. It's located in the centre of the country. This is our oil or, or, or our gold, uh, so to speak. If we didn't have this energy, we would have to import um, fossil fuels uh, to, to uh, pro provide us with electricity. But there are plenty of other uses for cheap power, and the aluminium industry, which uses huge amounts of electricity in its production smelters, is already taking advantage of Iceland's lower power tariffs. The three operating turbines of Hellas Heidi provide nearly half of Iceland's electricity. When completed, it will produce enough electricity to provide energy for the whole country. LG Display recently announced that it has developed an LCD display panel that refreshes 480 times every second. But what does this mean? Since flat panel display screens became popular, there has been a debate about the merits of two types of flat panel technology, liquid crystal or plasma. 
While the LCD panels had lower power consumption and better resolution, plasma screens had better contrast and could render fast-moving images more clearly. They could be made bigger too. Now, work done at the LG Developmental Labs in South Korea mean the company's soon-to-be-released True Motion Display panels will have a much quicker response time, eliminating problems associated with fast-moving images. And scanning backlight technology has enhanced the LCD's contrast. LG launched a range of new display screens at this year's Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas. They stretch from the very thin picture frame unit to a 60-inch model. The company's 55-inch HD unit has an LCD screen that uses a different system of light-emitting diodes to deliver superior contrast. Another innovation is the separation of the screen from its signal processing electronics. The two components connect wirelessly so that the screen can be easily mounted on the wall. In combination with the enhanced picture quality, many of the new screens feature an invisible speaker system. The trend is to make the display unit more like a picture that hangs on the wall, and to highlight this, an array of screens were arranged like pictures in a gallery. The LH50 and PS80 series HDTVs are equipped with Ethernet ports and can access selected web content. And the Tokyo Metropolitan Museum of Photography has just mounted an exhibition called Still Motion, Liquid Crystal Painting, that displays a collection of artworks on flat panel LCD screens. Dominic Lejman's YOLO V pays homage to Goya's painting, The Inquisition Tribunal. As the viewer approaches, his image is imported onto the screen. Sam Taylor Wood's Still Life pictures a bowl of fruit as it ages over several weeks. Yasumasa Morimura mimicked Vermeer's Girl with a Pearl Earring in his Vermeer study, Looking Back, by dressing up as the girl himself. Museum curator Satomi Fujimura explains that the artworks have their origins in traditional paintings, but they also explore future styles and directions that become possible as the use of technology in art evolves. Hiroshu Senju's A Forest of Water appears like a traditional Japanese folding screen. Julian Opie's minimalist figures, the woman with evening dress and Kira with a pendant, smile at the viewer. Shiyuki Kojima's rhythmic calm, Land of Sand, expresses the constant shifting of the dunes in the wind. One room of the gallery is pitch black and the LCD screens appear to emerge from the darkness, showing small scenes of moving life. The Tokyo Metropolitan Museum of Photography has always included film in its range of interests, but this LCD exhibition is a new development. It represents a fusion of the moving image and the more traditional framed art hanging on the wall. Space tourism race marked a milestone recently as British entrepreneur Sir Richard Branson and American aerospace designer Bert Rattan waved to a crowd from inside the cabin of a new aircraft designed to carry a passenger spaceship to launch altitude. The White Knight II mothership was christened with champagne before a crowd of engineers, dignitaries and space enthusiasts at the Mojave Air and Spaceport in the high desert north of Los Angeles. That's my second accident. We hope to be able to start a program where we can um, try to fly people incredibly quickly around the world, um, you know, from you know, New York to Australia in less than two hours. White Knight 2 is the largest all-carbon composite aircraft ever built. It is the brainchild of Bert Rattan, who made history in 2004 
when his Spaceship One became the first private manned aircraft to reach space. That historic space flight was accomplished with the help of White Knight II's smaller predecessor, White Knight. Now the new mothership must undergo at least a year of rigorous flight tests. Retired American astronaut Buzz Aldrin and his wife also took part in the event. You've done it before, huh? Well, I mean, the, the publicity benefit would accrue to whom? To me? No. I, I've been on the moon with Neil Armstrong, see? So I don't need the publicity. Next step is the completion of Spaceship Two which will be flown by two pilots and carry six passengers. Meanwhile, in the established space launch business, Belgian astronaut Frank DeWine is preparing for six months at the Columbus Laboratory on the International Space Station. He will fly with Russian cosmonaut Roman Romanenko and Canadian Space Agency astronaut Robert Thirsk. With the Columbus Laboratory finally functioning, Europe now has a very real long-term investment in the ISS. DeWine will be doing maintenance on the robotic arm and installing Japanese equipment bought up by the HTV cargo module, which is due to dock with the ISS soon after he arrives. As well, he will be carrying out experiments for scientists back on Earth. What scientists are trying to determine is if microgravity influences our perceptions of parallel lines. Orientation is something that is very important uh, also here on Earth, how people can orient themselves. Often all elderly people have problems with that. And by trying to measure the processes also in microgravity that are happening in our brain, scientists try to determine if they can find uh, also cures for diseases here on Earth. In 2002, DeWine spent 12 days in space aboard the ISS for ESA and Belgium's Odyssea mission. The European Space Agency is not taking any chances with its next astronaut, and Dutch ESA astronaut Andre Kuipers is serving as backup. In support of the upcoming mission, NASA has already sent up a shuttle carrying supplies and equipment. In America's Midwest, billions of tons of corn, once used as food, are now being used to produce ethanol. From this year, controversial federal mandates require the United States to use 34 billion litres of alternative fuel annually. That makes grain a high in-demand product. For those involved in the production chain for biofuels, it means more profit. A full 33% of this year's U.S. corn harvest, or 3.9 billion bushels, is expected to go towards ethanol production, up from 22%. Virtually all experts agree that using crops for biofuel drives up the price of grain, but opinions vary greatly as to how much. The world's poorest people are suffering because of the biofuels initiative. Many can no longer afford the most basic food staples and there are calls for strong measures to pull the current world food situation out of what some are describing as a crisis situation. <laughs> Estimates cited by the International Food Policy Research Institute say biofuels account for more than 30% of the food price increases. What is certain is that many people across the developing world are feeling the pinch. White House economic advisers say the ethanol industry accounts for just 2 to 3 per cent of the recent jump in grain prices, which are up more than 40 per cent since 2007. Despite the controversy, most governments are keen to hit their biofuel targets. But even if every bit of corn in the US was used to produce ethanol, American demand for fuel would still not be met. In the Netherlands, a different plant is being tested as a renewable fuel. 
algae could be part of the answer to the world's energy crisis. In Western Holland, a shallow pool that is rapidly turning green with algae is being harvested for animal feed, skin preparations, biodegradable plastics and biofuel. Algae is the slimy stuff that clouds your home aquarium and in larger form gets tangled in your feet in a lake or ocean. It can grow almost anywhere there is water and sunlight and under the right conditions it can double its volume within hours. Opinions differ on how best to grow algae and how quickly it can come on stream as a commercially viable alternative or supplement to fossil fuel. But scientists and industrialists agree the potential is huge. In a warehouse 200 kilometres southeast of Amsterdam, a bioreactor is producing algae in pressure cooker fashion that its manufacturer hopes will one day power jet aircraft.